Let me uh, express my uh, apologies for running a little bit late. Um, the family of uh, the late Stephanie Tubbs Jones was addressing a small group of us and uh, wanting to express their appreciation for things that we had done for the family. So that's why I'm running a little late. This subcommittee will come to order, and before we begin, begin today's hearing, we pause to remember Luke, Lieutenant Commander Andrew Weissmeyer, Aviation Survival Technician First Class David Skimmon, Aviation Maintenance Technician Second Class Joshua Nichols, uh, who were killed when the helicopter in which they were conducting training exercises crashed last week near Honolulu. We also remember, remember Commander Thomas Nelson, the Executive Officer of Air Station Barbers Point, who remains missing. Those who have died gave their lives in service to our great nation, and their deaths remind us of the risks that all Coast Guard members face every day. Our prayers are with the family of those who, are, who have been lost to us and with their comrades throughout the Coast Guard. And I ask that you join me in a moment of silence. Today I convened the subcommittee to consider the diversity in the Coast Guard, including the recruitment, promotion, and retention of minority personnel. In October of 2007, I visited the United States Coast Guard Academy to address the student body after a noose had been found in the effects of an African-American cadet and in the office of an officer conducting diversity training. The discovery of the nooses uh, was obviously shocking to the conscience and completely unacceptable at any Federal Service Academy. At that time, I emphasized that the Academy students, uh, students that diversity and our mutual respect for each other are our greatest strengths as a nation. Diversity is a promise that exists in every single individual, a promise that can only be cultivated and fully realized through our collective commitment to assure fair treatment to everyone. Yesterday, Congresswoman Sanchez, my colleague on the House Armed Services Committee, and I hosted a briefing conducted by the RAND Corporation, which Dr. Nelson Lim presented the options and recommendations that RAND had developed for leaders of the Department of Defense to assist them as they plan for diversity in all ranks of DOD services. I emphasize that expanding diversity is a challenge in all of the military services, not just in the Coast Guard. And I think it's important for each service to learn from the successes and challenges of the other services. The key point the RAND Corporation made is the following. In order for any strategic plan for supporting diversity to be effective, Leaders must define diversity, and then they must also explain how they intend to measure progress toward greater diversity and how they will hold themselves and others accountable for their progress. While the Coast Guard is not a part of DOD, the lessons that Rand, that Rand offered to the DOD are completely applicable to the Coast Guard. Under the leadership of Admiral Thad Allen, the Commandant of the Coast Guard, whom I know to be a man of the highest honor and integrity, Coast Guard is taking steps to prioritize expansion of diversity. In July of this year, the Commandant indicated that the Coast Guard would, quote, redouble, end of quote, its commitment to creating a more diverse workforce, and he announced new leadership and diversity initiatives the Coast Guard will now be pursuing. In August, the Commandant provided an update on the implementation of some of those initiatives in the form of a message issued to all members of the Coast Guard, commonly referred to as a all coast. The message described important steps the service is taking to expand its outreach. For example, example, the Commandant announced that flag officers and senior executive service staff members would partner with minority serving institutions, Hispanic serving institutions and tribal council institutions to raise the Coast Guard's visibility and to develop ongoing relationships. These are important initiatives, and I am anxious to hear more about how their imp implementation is proceeding. However, drawing on the lessons presented by the RAND Corporation, it is imperative that the Coast Guard's diversity initiatives form a 
coherent tactical plan designed to implement the Coast Guard's specific diversity goals. Therefore, I also look forward to discussing today how the Coast Guard defines its goals and how it will measure progress toward the achievement of these goals. According to data from Defense Manpower Data Center in 2007, 13.8 percent of the officer corps and 16.9 percent of the members of the enlisted ranks of the Coast Guard were minorities. About 14 percent of the students in the class of 2011 at the Coast Guard Academy are minorities, including individuals who self-identify as being multiracial. These are strong numbers, but they can be stronger. Importantly, however, and, and this goes back to my earlier point, Diversity should be defined to include not only the representation of certain groups, but their success and their effective inclusion in an entity. I firmly believe that the Coast Guard needs to bring the challenge of minority recruiting down to a personal basis. Each flag officer and each commanding officer of an air station, sector, cutter, or boy tender should be challenged to recruit one minority individual to apply to the Coast Guard Academy, the CSPI program, or to their officer candidate school. Current minority officers in the Coast Guard, as well as Coast Guard alumni, should be challenged to reach out to members of minority communities to present to them their firsthand knowledge of the opportunities associated with the service in the Coast Guard. I strongly believe that recruiting minority service members cannot just be left to recruiters. It needs to be everyone's shared priority. Additionally, each service member must make it a priority to do all that he or she can do to create an atmosphere in which each individual feels his or her expertise and perspective are valued. With that, I look forward to hearing from Admiral Beckenridge and uh, Master Chief Isherwood uh, today as we examine the steps the Coast Guard is taking to ensure that our nation's shield of freedom reflects the diversity that is truly one of the greatest sources of our nation's strength. And now I recognize our distinguished ranking member, Mr. Lantaret. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the time, and thank you for holding this hearing. Every day, more than 45,000 members, officers, and civilian employees carry out the Coast Guard's missions to safeguard life and property at sea. They perform these missions on the water, in the air, and at stations and units located throughout the country. These men and women are the representatives of our federal government and the face of our country in our ports and on the high seas. As such, it is important that the Coast Guard hire and retrain, retain the most qualified possible Coast Guard men and women and not discriminate in hiring on the basis of ethnicity or gender. I look forward to hearing about some of the initiatives that are in place and those that are being planned to expand the diversity of the Coast Guard. I also would like to examine some of the circumstances which may be roadblocks to these initiatives. I'm concerned about situations such as the lack of berthing space for female crew members aboard many of the Coast Guard's legacy vessels, which limit opportunities for Coast Guardsmen to build experience necessary for a successful career. I hope that the witnesses will discuss ways to enhance opportunities for young Coast Guardsmen to get this experience in the future. I want to thank our witnesses uh, for coming here today and for their willingness to address these issues, uh, and I look forward to their testimony, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Richardson. Mr. Coble. Very well, we will proceed with our hearing. The uh, Chairman of the House uh, Homeland Security Committee, uh, Chairman um, Benny Thompson, has prepared a statement for the record, and without objection, it will be included in the record and is so ordered. And I want to thank Chairman Thompson for his leadership on this issue and look forward to working with him to ensure that we achieve our shared goals of expanding diversity in the uh, Coast Guard. We'll now hear from our two witnesses, our two and only witnesses, uh, Rear Admiral uh, Jody Brickenridge is the Assistant Commandant for Human Resources with the United States Coast Guard, and Master Chief Petty Officer Kevin D. Isherwood is the Command Master Chief for the Chief of Staff of the United States Coast Guard. We welcome your testimony, and we'll hear from you, uh, Rear Admiral. Thank you, and good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the committee. As the Chairman said, I'm Rear Admiral Jody Breckenridge, the Coast Guard's Assistant Commandant for Human Resources. I am pleased today to be joined by Master Chief Isherwood, who will speak in just a moment, and also Mr. Kurt Odom, our Deputy Director for Personnel Management, and Rear Admiral Dan May, who is our Chief of Reserve and Training. 
In addition to my human resource duties, I am also the director for strategic, the strategic transformation team with responsibilities to synchronize our efforts to modernize the Coast Guard. I departed duty as commander of the 11th Coast Guard District in California in the summer of 2007 to assume duties as the director of the team. Mr. Chairman, uh, I request that my written statement be entered into the record. Without objection. Mr. Chairman, since assuming my duties as Assistant Commandant for Human Resources on 31 May of this year, one of my top priorities has been and remains our diversity action plan. I am personally involved in the strategic plan and the tactical execution of each of the initiatives. First, it's the right thing to do with the changing demographics of our nation. We would like more citizens to know of the opportunities in the Coast Guard and to consider service in the Coast Guard, whether as part of our full-time military, our part-time military or reserve force, our civilian workforce, or our volunteer workforce, the Coast Guard Auxiliary. Second, we have a large stakeholder base, both domestically and internationally. We need to be able to interact effectively to achieve new safety and security standards for the maritime community. Mr. Chairman, I know you are aware of the concerns raised over our marine inspectors and investigators capacity and experience level. Quite frankly, we have good people, but we're too homogeneous in our sourcing. We tend to be predominantly Coast Guard bred and developed in that community. Third, the simple reality is heterogeneity offers ways to look at and solve problems that homogeneity does not. So what are we doing? We are looking across a career continuum. It is not enough to hire more people. We must also develop them and retain them. Within our plan, we have addressed tangible, actionable steps that create a foundation to build on for sustainability. But to be honest, our current plan is more focused on accessions at this time. We are doing better in our enlisted corps than our officer corps. We developed the strategic metropolitan area and recruiting territory known as our SMART program, which uses data to drive our recruiting efforts, focusing our efforts on high schools and regions with high minority populations. This effort, since its inception in 2003, when I was the commanding officer of the recruiting command, has resulted in 30 to 39 percent minority accessions each year. We also have robust opportunities for enlisted to move into our officer corps from our enlisted corps through our officer candidate school, direct commission programs, enlisted to warrant, warrant to lieutenant, and to our academy, a program we are reemphasizing this year. A number of our minority enlisted, along with their majority counterparts, move from our enlisted ranks to the officer corps through these programs. Within our officer corps, we are challenged by our need for more than 47% of our officer annual accessions to have technical degrees, math, science, engineering, operations research, and computer majors. STEM, which stands for science, technology, engineering, and math, is a frequently used term to describe these fields. To meet that requirement, our academy must produce 70% of their graduates with these degrees. To expand the base of underrepresented students at the academy, we are looking to expand their participation in our academy introduction mission program, also known as AIM. We are seeking assistance from Congress, sir, and getting the word out for this opportunity. We are also more actively marketing our preparatory program called Coast Guard Academy Scholars Program, both externally and internally. To assist Congress in understanding Academy requirements, we are currently advertising a position I am taking out of Hyde as a bridging strategy until I can get on budget to work with congressional staffs to identify candidates or new affinity groups we should be engaged with. For our college student pre-commissioning initiative, we are looking at two-year schools to select participants whom the Coast Guard will pay for their last two years of school and then attend officer candidate school. We are also looking at two-year schools for the Coast Guard Academy to partner with, schools with strong STEM curricula to select students at the one or two-year point to attend the Academy. As part of our outreach initiatives, our flags and SESs are establishing relationships with minority-serving institutions. In some cases, we are reestablishing relationships, such as those we previously had with Morgan State University. Mid-grade and junior officers are also being assigned as part of the outreach team. This alignment creates a mentoring chain and sustainability with the institution. As flags and SESs retire, they will be replaced. 
As the more junior officers become more senior, more junior officers will, be, will continue to be assigned. In the retention arena, we're working on mentoring and development of our mid-grade officers and enlisted, expanding requirements for individual development plans for lieutenants, lieutenant commanders, E5s, and E6s. We believe in the networking and professional development opportunities offered by affinity groups, such as the National Naval Officers Association, and are increasing our participation at these venues. A few years ago, participation across the board in the National Naval Officers Association had waned. And it was through the efforts of then Captain Manson Brown, U.S. Coast Guard, now Rear Admiral Brown, that the organization was rejuvenated. We have an active diversity advisory group composed of members of all of our workforces from across the Coast Guard. They meet with the Commandant to provide him and other senior managers with concerns and recommendations. And they participated in the development of our action plan. We also have a number of similar initiatives focused on our civilian workforce to bring in new perspectives and youth. We are leveraging new opportunities with modernization, including looking at virtual organizations and growth such as the Marine Safety Program to put new accession programs in place and to enhance workplace options to appeal to an even greater talent pool. Mr. Chairman, these are a few of our initiatives. I appreci appreciate this opportunity. It is a topic I am passionate about and committed to. Our service has demonstrated success if you look at where women are in our service. We remain the only armed service where every career field is open to women, a standard we established in 1977. We're the only service where a woman has achieved the number two position in the service. We cannot say the same for continuity for our minorities. Today, 19.5% of the 41 of our flag corps are women and minorities. Three or one third of our SES corps are minority and 44% are minority or women a result that has occurred under Admiral Allen. We have some bright spots, but we still have much to do. I know that you, sir, are committed to assisting us in this journey, and we look forward to partnering with you and the other members of Congress. I look forward to the questions in our discussion, sir. Thank you very much, Commander. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the, comp of the committee. I am Mass Chief Kevin Isherwood, Command Mass Chief for the Chief of Staff of the United States Coast Guard. I've served in the Coast Guard for 26 years and most recently served in the 11th District with Rear Admiral Breckenridge. I'm happy to appear today alongside Admiral Breckenridge and Mr. Kurt Odom to answer any questions that you may have on diversity in the United States Coast Guard. As the Command Mass Chief, I am the Senior Enlisted Advisor to the Chief of Staff and an integral member of Rear Admiral Breckenridge's staff. My main function is to provide a field reality check in all situations. One of the greatest values a Command Mass Chief offers is their relationship and understanding of the workforce issues, to remain credible and to prevent gaps from growing in these critical relationships. I spend a considerable amount of my time visiting and communicating with my units. I'm a resource person who assists Coast Guard personnel and subordinate commands to work through local and national issues, including diversity, with the intent of resolving these issues at the lowest effective level. While I'm not directly in the chain of command, I help strengthen the chain of command by working closely with the folks within the chain of command, providing personal experiences and ground truth feedback. This enhances communications and fosters a better understanding of the needs and viewpoints of all Coast Guard members and their families. In other words, my job is to balance workforce desires with mission requirements. The vision of the Command Mass Chief Program is proactively assist Coast Guard members to be ready today, preparing for tomorrow. Command Mass Chiefs advise all Team Coast Guard members on personal policies, programs, ideas, and opportunities pertinent to the well-being allowing to their well-being, allowing them to focus on performing their mission and enhancing their careers. Additionally, by advising, consulting, and participating in high-level policy issues, Command Mass Chiefs play an important role in the continuous improvement of the Coast Guard 
with the goal of all Coast Guard members attaining their full potential. Again, thank you for the time and thank you for providing me an opportunity of a lifetime speaking before you on this important topic. Thank you very much, um, Admiral. Let me uh, go back to something you said. I think you mentioned a, a, a program that you had at Morgan State University at one time. Sir, we had a, uh, Mr. Chairman, we had a relationship with Morgan State University and it was predominantly for our uh, college student pre-commissioning initiative program, but over time, for some reason, uh, that relationship waned. I can't tell you why, but we are committed to reinitiating that relationship and revigorating it, particularly as we look at our requirements for STEM-oriented uh, students, sir. And what did the program do? I mean, because Morgan State is in my district. That's why I'm just um, curious. Uh, actually, As a matter of fact, I'm on the board of Morgan State also. Go ahead. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Morgan State actually acted in, at one time as an advisor to the Coast Guard as we were looking at some of the challenges that we had with diversity, provided some insights in what we should be doing from program perspective, and then we also sought their advice on what we should be doing as we were looking at the, the C-SPY program. It had a different name at the time. Um, and how we should be seeking out minority students to avail them of the opportunities that were in that program, Mr. So Chairman. So you are looking at going back, is that what you said? Uh, yes, sir, we, Mr. Odom and I have been talking to the Dean of Engineering mm -hmm. uh, at Morgan State, and we have yet to get our schedules to work out to have a sit-down meeting, but we intend to go back up and sit down and talk with the uh, Dean to look at the engineering field and where we perhaps should be looking. Thank you very much. Now let's, let's go to another college, and that is the Coast Guard Academy. The uh, Comprehensive Climate and Cultural Optimization Review effort conducted at the Academy and dated February 2007 found that, and I, I quote, the uh, number of African American high school students who are academically ready for an Academy experience eligible and interested in military service is estimated at only 640 young people per year in the nation. Where does this uh, number come from? And what is limiting this number? And is it academic qualification or interest in military service or both? Mr. Chairman, that was done for us by an independent contractor looking at an enrollment management scheme. It takes the full spectrum of academics, uh, physical requirements, and across the board, and represents that one contractor's uh, opinion, sir. Uh, as we look at the academy, we are committed to the open access. As I noted, sir, in my statement, uh, Mr. Chairman, our big challenge is, is looking at the propensity of students across this nation to go into STEM majors. That's an absolute requirement for our workforce, and sir, uh, as I noted, 70 percent of the academy graduates is the target for them pr to produce with STEM degrees. For students who are interested in the military service but perhaps not academically or physically prepared for the rigors of the academy, the academy can offer placement in, prepar in preparatory school, is that right? Mr. Chairman, we do have preparatory schools. Uh, we have two of them, that, two that we're focused on right now. That is the Coast Guard Scholars Program. I don't think that's been a well-advertised program, and we are working very hard right now on advertising. And if you go to the Coast Guard Academy website, it is advertised there. It is in every package that goes out. As we look at parents' packages, it is in all of their packages. But we're also marketing it inside the Coast Guard for those within our own workforce who might have the propensity to go to the academy but might need an academic boost, Mr. Chairman. And so how many students does the Coast Guard send to these preparatory schools each year? Do you know? Uh, sir, right now we are at 61 tabs, Mr. Chairman. 61? Yeah, yes, sir, which represents about 21 percent of our um, student population at the academy, which compares with the other academies. If you look at their preparatory programs, their preparatory programs represent about 25 percent, Mr. Chairman. And so what percentage of those uh, students then uh, come on into the academy? In other words, you got a number going. That doesn't mean that all of them are going to end up, a number going to the preparatory school. It, yes, sir. And I'm just trying to figure out when they when everything filters down, uh, how many of those then go on to, uh, to the Coast Guard again? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to provide that for the record. To be honest, my memory's failing me right now. What I would like to offer you on that, though, is 
It, the academy has focused not just on getting uh, students into the academy, but is really focused on, on retention once they're in. The goal of all of these programs is to produce uh, individuals as they become commissioned officers who are positioned for success in our service. The academy as they've looked at the programs that they have and the focus that they've had on retention in recent years has gone from 66 percent to a 75 percent retention rate. Is that, we, where, is that where we are right now, 75 percent? Yes, Mr. Chairman. That's How does that compare to the other academies? Uh, it is the other academies. I would like to provide that for the record, sir. All right. And so to 75 percent, and you're saying before this it was 61 percent? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. And what is the, what the, um, you know, a lot of young people when they go into the academies, it's just not this academy, but I'm also on the Board of Trustees of the Naval Academy. Uh, we have people who uh, come in and maybe they're not, um, maybe the military atmosphere is not something that is conducive with their personality. Others, academic problems, what have you. What do you find, uh, certainly finance is not an issue here, um, but what, what do you find the reasons we're losing uh, young people? Uh, I mean, and, and, and is there anything in, in unique to the minority population uh, we're losing reasons why as compared to uh, the rest of the student body? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I can't offer an insight at large that there's a distinctive difference between our minority students and uh, the larger population. What I would offer, I think, is, is a good correlation and why we want to look at our AIM program is that when we look at the students who go to, to the AIM program, there's a very high correlation to those who go and get access to what it would be like to attend an academy, who then make a decision to attend the academy and are then successfully uh, come out the other end to be co a commissioned officer, Mr. Chairman. What does the retention program, what do the students in the retention, you said there, you, first of all, I agree that we need to be, it's not enough to admit students we want to make sure that they do well and then go on to do what other students do, that is to become leaders. So the retention program makes a lot of sense. I'm just wondering, what, what's entailed in, in that? What, do, what, would a, what would somebody in that program get that somebody else might not get? You follow me? Uh, yes, sir. In other words, the general population yes. might not get what? Mr. Chairman, is the question compared words, to the population the retention... at large in, in the civilian sector? In other words, what I'm asking you is that you have a, is there a, something called a retention program? Is that true? Well, Mr. Chairman, we have retention initiatives and we look at retention rates. Okay, fine. There are things that you do to try to make sure there is retention of these minority students. Is that correct? Is that what you're saying? Uh, as we look at the atmosphere at the Academy, Mr. Chairman, we're concerned that, um, or we want to ensure that all students feel uh, that they are valued at the Academy and that they will have the opportunity to succeed. If we look at our academic population at the Academy, we are working on diversifying that so that uh, as students have issues, they feel comfortable having access to individuals that they feel they may want to need to address things with. We've also focused on the climate at the academy so that if there are issues, uh, cadets feel that they can bring those issues to the attention of the chain of command so that they can be addressed. As you know, any academy, Mr. Chairman, has a mentorship program within the, the cadet or the student population itself. But on top of that, within uh, our headquarters, we have a, a uh, office in leadership and we have hired a new individual that's looking at our mentorship programs and in fact we are linking junior officers who are out in the field up with cadets so that they know what it's like once they finish through the academy what is it going to be like joining the officer corps of the Coast Guard Mr. Chairman. Now the February 2007 report uh, also stated that approximately seven percent of the Academy staff and faculty are minority, uh, compared with about 24% of the Coast Guard workforce and 14% of the Corps of Cadets. And I just want to ask, how many African American teachers do you currently have at the Academy, and how many Hispanics, and what are 
what are you doing to increase those numbers going to the statement that you just made, by the way? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll provide the numbers for the record, and there's a concerted effort as we look at each one of the vacancies that we have to make sure that we have a very broad outreach uh, so we diversify the pools that we are of individuals that we are considering for each position that comes available. All right. Thank you. Mr. Latourette. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you both for your testimony. Uh, Admiral, I, uh, just a, a question before I talk about uh, some of the other specifics. I was just talking to Mr. Rayfield, and a week from Saturday in my district, we're going to have uh, our, our Military Academy Information Day. And, and I guess I would ask you, um, does the Coast Guard attend those on a regular basis, or do you need to be invited? We, we attend a number of those on a regular basis. Um, uh, sir, I won't, I won't say that we have visibility of every one of them, so we're always looking for new opportunities. Okay. I, I don't know how it is in the Chairman's District or other members' district, but when we go through the, the military screening, which we do in November, we often find that uh, the Naval Academy is oversubscribed and, and we have more applicants than, than we can satisfy with nominations. And, and uh, I think that, that I, I, don't, I don't know how we'd get it done, but I bet you could get more customers in more districts if, if we worked out a way, Chairman, to, to have the Coast Guard present at these Military Academy Information Days and maybe a young man or a young woman that's, that uh, thinks the Navy's right for them and it, it doesn't work out uh, because of, of numbers in terms of what the member nominates or the senator nominates that, that perhaps they could s switch over and get into the competition for one of the slots at the, uh, the Academy. So I, I guess the question is, would you, uh, I mean, any reason that the service wouldn't if we sort of work this out between us and, and send a little memo and ask the, the Commandant to participate. Any impediment to doing that? No, sir, just number of events and people on a single night. But we would, we would welcome that as a challenge. Okay. Well, I, I, I just from, from my area, I think it would be a good idea because I, I, I think in this day and age, any, any young person that wants to serve their country uh, in the armed forces is a, is a gift. Uh, and I hate to turn them away. I mean, it, it becomes sort of... A, a sad thing when you have people raring at the bit to go and you know and then th these are young people these are the best and the brightest I mean I, I forget what the requirements are but it's like a 3-5 average and and a lot of these people at 18 have done more than some people I met in their 50s and 60s quite frankly in terms of Eagle Scout activities and and other things so I I, I think uh, you know those that don't make the cut in, in terms of nomination not not because you know uh, anything else that um, I think the Coast Guard would be glad to have some of them. Yes, sir. And the resource uh, that I was talking about uh, that we intend to put on uh, the Congressional Affairs staff it would be specifically to interact to make sure that people had visibility of the requirements of our academy and also to make sure that we had full visibility, full visibility of these opportunities and that we did show up. Okay. Well, I thank you for that. Uh, the, uh, the Coast Guard Academy is the only service academy, of course, that that considers applicants on the merit of their qualifications in open competition and not through the nomination process by the president, the vice president, or, or members of Congress. And, and I would ask you, how does the open application process impact the size and quality of the applicant pool at the academy? Um, sir, we get a number of people who look at the Coast Guard Academy, but quite frankly, we are looking for a larger pool, and we are looking for different composition within that pool. We do not have the visibility, uh, the national visibility that our sister service academies have, nor if you look at the alumni num sheer numbers that they have and reach that they have the, through their in alumni, as well as the histories of our services where minorities have served. I, I think there are, are some differences there that become challenges for us. Has the, uh, the Coast Guard begun to look at uh, what changes would be required to uh, transition to the nomination-based uh, system that is uh, uh, spelled out in the House-passed Coast Guard reauthorization bill? Uh, we, we have started to look at that, sir, and to be blunt, we do have some concerns about there being some potential barriers uh, given, given the size of the population that actually enters, is in an entering class at the Coast Guard Academy, it's, it's uh, less than 250 in a very strong year and can be less than 200 uh, in other years. So given, given the small numbers, and then just given um, right now anybody across the country, we're not limited by any geographic boundaries that are in the nomination process process, we can take 15 people from the same high school into the academy, and we think that's a plus, sir, but we need to change what's in the pool that we have right now. Have, have you or anybody at the service ever collected any data 
uh, aside from the question of diversity, diversity in terms of, of geography. And, and by that I mean to most of the people that apply to your academy or, or seek to become in the enlisted corps come from the coasts and, and areas that border water as opposed to the young fellow that's in Oklahoma or Nebraska, which... Yes, sir. We have looked at the demographics and that there are six states that were predominantly from California is one of them. Not too surprisingly, the Northeast represents a large portion. We do get a number from Maryland, sir. So, yes, sir. We have looked at those demographics. And, and I would think Alaska, too, probably. Um, I don't remember where Alaska was on the list, sir, but I'll be happy to provide that. Okay. And then lastly, uh, the, well, two quick things. The chairman mentioned Morgan State, and I he also mentioned our, our colleague who's recently passed, Stephanie Tubbs-Jones. She has a great uh, engineering school, Cleveland State University, in her district as well. And one of the criticisms I get, you know, when you talk about outsourcing this, that, and the other thing, that, that a lot of people coming out of that engineering program say that they can't find jobs, uh, that why are firms hiring engineers that are trained or from other countries rather than uh, American-made, born uh, engineers. And, 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 and so is there in your strategy, uh, aside from the Morgan States of the world, uh, a plan to sort of reach out to, if your skill set that you're looking for are engineers or people with engineering training, to reach out to all of the engineering programs in the country that, uh, uh, that might increase the diversity that we're talking about? Uh, yes, sir. We, we are in uh, professional associations that look um, both at naval engineering, civil engineering, and engineering in general, and, and that are affiliated with most of the institutions that produce engineers for this country. Uh, I will, we're, we're trying to focus our effort instead of going very broadly, which is something that we did in the past and we weren't able to sustain it. If we want relationships with schools, we're trying to start small and make sure that we understand what their requirements are and that we can produce results out of that both for the school and for ourselves, uh, that we can then build on and expand out. Okay. And, and now, lastly, the, the, in my opening statement, I talked about the, uh, the observation that there may be some birthing shortages for women on some of the legacy vessels. Is the service uh, addressing that, and if so, how? Uh, it, it is being addressed, sir. It has been addressed uh, on some of our legacy assets. It is certainly true that as we look at the women who serve that um, there are sometimes constraints in individual assignment cycles where a birth may not be available on a particular unit that they want to go to. But there is no class of vessels that is closed to them, and as we look at our new um, national security cutters coming out, they offer much more um, and many more options in the birthing spaces that allow us to look at um, more, more opportunities for women. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. And it's, uh, it, it certainly is an eye opener to have the opportunity to look at the different academies and what percentages. Uh, it should not surprise anyone that the military academy leads the way in the, in the greatest diversity. Um, but, but Ms. Breckenridge, I want to get to uh, something the chairman brought up. I, uh, as, as a former Coastie, when Congressman Overstar first proposed that members of Congress should be allowed to nominate people, I, I, at first I was a little taken aback. And the more I thought about it and the more I look around the House floor, the diversity on the House floor where we're selected by 700,000 Americans from all over the country who pick a congressman, and, and quite often congressmen tend to pick, um, tend to pick, nominate people that they're comfortable with, they, that they, they think would be good officers. My personal view, having thought about this, is that we would expand your pool of recruiters by 535. That the analogy that Mr. LaTourette was talking about, I, I see it every year. I, I've got at least 20 great kids for five slots that I'm promised. And I guarantee that if one of those great kids, if I said, you know what, the only slot I have open is the Coast Guard Academy where you take it, I guarantee one of those 14 that are left out or 15 that are left out would jump at the opportunity that, that I think the Coast Guard Academy would get some great kids that A, didn't know of the opportunity or that you didn't get a chance to know just because of your limited resources. So having stated my opinion now on Mr. Overstar's proposal, I'm curious, what's the Commandant's opinion? 
Sir, I'd be happy to give you my opinion. Okay. <laughs> Not so, I don't want to put words in the Commandant's it, mouth. But it's obviously easier to pass something that regards the Coast Guard if the Commandant is in favor of it. Yes, sir. What well, I, I think the organization does feel that we see barriers in there. And the, and the barriers are, first of all, it is an extended application process in the environment in which you compete for youth today. Anything that has multiple numbers of steps and takes a long period of time creates a barrier. And quite frankly, there are students who won't apply. I think one of the reasons the other... You, you, um, yet, Admiral, you haven't answered my question. Specifically to the Overstar proposal to allow members of Congress to nominate young people to the Coast Guard Academy, has the, has the Coast Guard taken a position? Our position is that we prefer the system that we have today, sir. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, for all the reasons that I just outlined and, and for, for the reasons that the chairman held this hearing. I, I happen to think in retrospect that it, uh, Mr. Oberstar's proposal has a heck of a lot of merit. Well, we hope, sir, that regard- and, and by the way, it works for the Merchant Marine Academy, which is about the same size as your academy. Um, sir, we'll be happy to provide for the record the statistics between the academies because we don't believe the statistics show that, sir. Well, okay, well, please correct me because what I'm looking at is the Merchant Marine Academy typical class is about 285. Coast Guard Academy, typical class around 200. That's not a whole lot of difference. I could see the difference between yourselves and the Air Force Academy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think uh, we're doing slightly better than the Merchant Marine Academy. If you look at African Americans, we're doing better than the Merchant Marine Academy with Asians. We're doing better than the Merchant Marine Academy okay. with Hispanics. We're doing better than the Merchant Marine Academy with Native Americans. Ad and Admiral, I thought your point was that, again, with 535 additional recruiters and the fact that you're only going to have about 200 to a class, that could complicate things, and I understand that. But apparently the Merchant Marine Academy handles that problem to, I guess, at, at least to the satisfaction of, of most of the members of Congress who are nominating people. Sir, I can't speak to how Congress uh, views that. I certainly respect that opinion. It would be our hope, sir, that since we do demonstrate that at this point with the system we have that we are doing better, that working with Congress to look at the AIM program and expand and, and expanding the understanding and opportunity that exists at the academy, that we would do better than the other academies overall with the open system for competition that we have for the academy. I see the yellow light, so just for the heck of it, who is, who serves on your selection committee now? How big a committee is it? What is, are they, you know, what's the breakdown between active service and retirees? What's the breakdown by rank, or does it fluctuate year from year? I'll be happy to provide that for the record, sir. You, you don't know? I, I don't have that at my fingertips, no, sir. Could you give me a rough guess? Uh, no, sir, I would not want to do that for the record. I'll have be you, happy to provide have, that, sir. Have you for ever you. served on one of these boards? I have not served on one of the boards. How about you, Chief? No, no. No, sir, I have not served on one of those boards. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Cobo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Admiral, good to have you and the Master Chief with us. Admiral, you may have touched on this earlier, but let me, let me ask you this question. And I, I'm talking about specific numbers. How does the Coast Guard Academy minority enrollment, let's strike that. Let me first of all define minority enrollment. I guess when we say minority enrollment, it probably applies to any applicant who is not a male Caucasian. Is that accurate? Sir, we, we do not include women as a minority. We track women separately. All right, let me go back to my question. How does the U.S. Coast Guard Academy minority enrollment compare with other academies? Now, I think you just, in response to Mr. Taylor, said it was favorable. Do you have specific numbers? And, uh, if, and if not, I'd like for you to make those available to us. I would be happy to provide those for the record. I do have the percentage in front of me, percentages in front of me, and what I will say is that when you look at women, from for a number of years, the Coast Guard has far exceeded any of the other academies. Now, do you all maintain separate numbers as to females, African American, Hispanics? Do you break it down that thoroughly? Yes, sir, we can. And you can make those numbers available to us? Yes, sir, we can. All right. Uh, and you may have touched on this with Mr. Lauderette and Mr. Taylor. 
how does the current application process compare to those that are in place at the Merchant Marine Academy, which is comparable student body number-wise to you all, and the other service academies whose student bodies are probably more than four times the enrollment at the Coast Guard Academy? Uh, as we talk to the Merchant Marine Academy and look at their process, I think that uh, we're able to do early acceptances, which although the other academies do, we can, we can float our numbers with much more ease, and um, I think we move through the process much faster than they do. Now, to reiterate, Admiral, to be sure I'm reading it correctly, you, you did say that, that the Coast Guard Academy compares favorably with all the other academies. Uh, I was comparing the Coast Guard Academy, sir, to the Merchant Marine Academy. There's no question if you look at some of the other academies that in some arenas they are doing better than we are if you look at specific categories. And specifically, if you look at Hispanics, the Naval Academy is doing much better than uh, all the other services right now. So it goes category by category, sir. Where the Coast Guard stands out is with women, sir. All right, how many minority officers have been advanced to flag rank in the last three years? Uh, right now we have one African-American uh, flag officer, sir. We have two Hispanics and we have five women. All right, and, and finally, Admiral, uh, do you or the, or the Master Chief have any uh, accounts you could share with us regarding recruiting underrepresented groups of officers, enlisted uh, civilians, reservists, et cetera, uh, to share with the committee? Uh, yes, sir. As I have mentioned, the AIM program, certainly I think as we look at our college scholarship programs that we have, of which the CSPI or the college student pre-commissioning initiative opportunity that exists, I think that we don't have more people apply just simply because people don't know of the opportunities. Uh, we're a small service and our reach only goes so far. So I think that is one of our challenges and why we want to put a resource on the Hill to work with Congress to look at the opportunities that exist in your districts. The other opportunity that, that exists is as we look at the Coast Guard Academy, we have renewed the uh, Board of Visitors that we have, which we have asked members of Congress to serve on and certainly through that venue we would look at Congress to help us with recruiting and leveraging opportunities um, without a formal nomination process. Thank you both, Mr. Chairman. I, with your permission, I've got a judiciary meeting I've got to attend, but thank you again for having held, held this hearing. Thank you very much. Rear Admiral, before we get to um, Congresswoman Richardson, let me, let me just make sure I'm clear on something. You said something that uh, is going to keep me awake tonight. Um, you said that you have 200 people and you said that if you got 15 from the same high school, there's nothing wrong with that, pretty much. I see a lot wrong with that. When we've got hundreds of high schools, I mean, I probably got, I probably have about, in my one congressional district, about 50. Yeah. And, hear me now, hear me now. And if there's nothing wrong with out of a class of 200, 50, 15 coming from the same high school, I mean, it, it, it should concern all of us. And, I'm, and let me tell you what was bothering me. Um, when the proposal that um, Mr. Taylor was talking about was floated, we got a lot of response from, on that proposal. And a lot of those responses, it, it appeared, now just telling you what I got, was a group of people who basically have uh, had, they've got legacy situations going on. You've got a lot of people who love the Coast Guard. Don't get me wrong. I mean, a lot of wonderful people coming from wonderful states. But this can be the situation from now until I've been in heaven for 200 years. At some point, just because, I mean, if you've got a few states that seem to be getting all the, the folks, we cannot use an excuse that it's, it's a small situation. Taxpayers' dollars are paying every dime, every dime for that academy. And if, if we're not, if, we, if, it, if it's small and we don't have the budget, we need, to, we need to work together to make sure people know about the academy and know about these opportunities. There is no excuse for us, all of us, and I don't, I'm not knocking the Coast Guard. Yes, sir. But, but it, it bothers me if somebody tells me 
that it would not bother them if out of 200 kids, 15 of them came from that same high school when I got 50 high schools in my district. Mr. And Chairman. we got 435 districts. I would be, I mean, I, I would be, I would, I would be so upset, I wouldn't know what to do if I were in your position. And I'm, I'm just curious, did I miss something? Mr. Chairman. I'm quiet, I want to hear it. Mr. Chairman, if I may revise my answer. Uh, the, the intent of my response, Mr. Chairman, was r right now each congressman, congresswoman, has a set number of nominations. If from your district, sir, we were to have, and I heard uh, one of the questions that there was an oversubscribing for Naval Academy. Too many applied for that. If within that, those were the top candidates, there is no barrier for whatever portion of that oversubscription entering the academy to enter the, to enter the Coast Guard Academy. And, and yes, sir, we would be concerned if we had 15 from one high school. I did talk about the fact that we are homogeneous, and that represents a category of homogeneous thinking coming out of any one institution. So yes, we do want broader representation, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry, Ms. Richardson. Ms. Richardson, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to build upon what the chairman was just saying and also Mr. Taylor here. Um, Ma'am, Ms. Rear, Rear Admiral, to say that you're doing better than some other academy, in my opinion, is not good enough. And let me tell you why. African Americans, you have seven out of 206. That's 3.3 percent. I don't think you should be striving for being better than some other academy. You should be striving to do a good job. And whether that happens to be 10 points better than another academy or 20 points better, so be it. But you shouldn't set yourself to a standard that, in my opinion, is unacceptable. Total minorities, you have 29 out of 206. That's 14 percent. This country right now is almost 50 percent minority. So for you saying you're proud about being 14 percent to us is not reflective of what this nation is about. So when you just said you're happy to have top candidates, what makes a person a top candidate? Um, Ma'am, if I may go back uh, to my opening statement where I set the three cornerstones of why we think we need to be more diverse, I did, I did address the issues that we are not satisfied with where we are right now, and I stated that emphatically in my oral statement. I don't think we should be bound by numbers. We are not reflective of the American public, and we need to be reflective of the American public. We would like to be the best, the most diverse organization, because we think that will make us serve the American public and our nation even better. So we are not satisfied with where so we are. So then your opening statement should be consistent with the answers to your questions, because the answer to the question was not consistent with that. And let me, let me build upon, because you haven't answered my question yet, so let me drill down even further. Let me I guess, is it important to know how to swim, to be in the Coast Guard? We do have swimming requirements that come in at our accession programs, but we will teach people how to swim. Okay. Let me tell you something about that. My district, I have one, my former city council district, I have one swimming pool. And kids fight to get into that swimming pool. Literally fight to get into it. And so you say, oh, we'll teach people. Okay, so if a young person has an opportunity to choose between going into the Marines or West Point or wherever they're going to go, and they've got to come to the Coast Guard and learn how to swim where they've never in their lives had an opportunity to swim, you're not comparing apples to apples here. And that's what some of my colleagues are talking about. When you talk about it's okay to get top candidates from whatever school, uh, you know, Chatwick, in California where they might have a swimming pool on every corner and then you come to my district where we might only have one or two swimming pools it's difficult for that candidate pool to rise to the level let's talk about grades in my district Los Angeles Unified School District the second largest school district in the country they speak over 200 languages so to say Joe Blow kid who has the same opportunity as someone else is not always the case. And so what we're striving to help you understand is by being members of Congress, by being representative of our public, we have a good sense of what some of these challenges are and maybe some good suggestions of how we could work with you to better equalize the pool that you have. 
Ma'am, we would welcome your insights, um, and if I don't appear receptive, then I'm not communicating well, because I am receptive. We do want to broaden out, but the reality, if I can just talk about the academy, um, it is not an entry requirement to be able to swim. I, I personally was not a strong swimmer. Had I been around water, I had seen water, I had been at the ocean, but I was not a swimmer when I entered the Coast Guard. And in fact, at Officer Candidate School, I was put in remedial swimming. It is a requirement because we operate in and around the water that I at least be able to save myself if something happened to me when I'm in the water. Now, beyond that, there are, for some of our ratings, our rescue swimmers, you obviously have to be a very strong swimmer. To go specifically to um, the question that you asked about what, what makes someone competitive, uh, it, it, what we use at the academy, what's called the whole person concept, it is true that we have a strong academic requirement. I talked about people being, having a strong foundation in math. Our, our first semester at the academy, they have to take 21 hours. That's the most stringent of any of the academies. And we lose students at the end of the first year due to academics. We want to make sure that we're selecting people and preparing people to be successful. But it isn't just looking at um, SAT scores, ACT scores, or what high school they come to. We look at what kinds of activities are they in. We look at the leadership opportunities that they've looked at. And when we compare what high schools they come from, as, as I'm sure you're aware, ma'am, there are a number of normative scales that allow you to look across high schools. What we're really looking for is if they have the foundation because we want them to be successful. If they don't, if it doesn't look like that at, at the start to get right in the academy, we talk to them about our preparatory programs and whether they would be interested in those opportunities. Excuse me. Um, I'm 35 seconds over, so let me close with this point. I'm not suggesting that members of the Coast Guard don't need to know how to swim. Clearly they do. What I'm trying to explain to you is I'm a good movie buff. And so, for example, I saw The Guardian. And if I'm a kid who doesn't know how to swim or has limited s swimming ability, that kid may hesitate to go to your academy versus another one just from what they've seen and what they've watched. And what we're trying to explain to you is that by having a greater degree of outreach, by having a greater degree of involvement of your members of Congress, if we're, uh, Mr. Taylor asked you point blank, would you be supportive of us being involved in your process uh, in terms of applications? And the answer was no. And so my point to you is what we're trying to convey to you is by our involvement, we can help you from an outreach perspective to, under, to help young people to understand what they can do to prepare so they will be open to consider your academy and to be uh, better applicants when they do apply. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank Th you very much. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Please. may I respond? Yes. Um, I, I appreciate that very much, and we welcome your assistance. We welcome applicants uh, through the members of Congress. I think. Uh, and this is not, a, I think where we have a difference is whether it has to be through a nomination process to make the difference that we're talking about. I believe we all have the same goal of opening these opportunities up to find every American out there who aspires to become a member of any part of our services, that we afford the visibility of those opportunities and the opportunity to right. access those opportunities. So, Do you we have an urban that. recruitment plan? We, that is our SMART program, ma'am. You do. I'd like to see some info about it. Thank you. How much, is, uh, how much money do you have for recruitment? I mean, in your budget for recruitment? For, you know? if, I don't have the academy figures right in front of me, but it's $18 million for our recruiting command. That's what's in their budget. So in other words, $18 million to recruit the Two, two, 200 people? No, sir. That is our total requirements across. That is predominantly for our enlisted and uh, our non-academy sources, both officer enlisted and civilian, sir. All right. Um, one of the things as we get to Mr. Gilchrist, I, you know, I know that you have concerns about the proposal that uh, Mr. Oberstar and I submitted, but I want you to understand, you said something a moment ago about how uh, you would hope that the Congress would have some effect with regard to sitting on the board and what have you. Um, and th that may be true, but well, let me tell you what happens he here. 
for, say, for example, in my district, I'm able to reach people that you'll never reach. Hello? Yeah, yes, Mr. I'm just telling Chairman, you. We agree with that. I'm able to reach people that you will never reach. I don't care how much money you have. You'll never reach them. And what and so what Congress people are able to do is reach into a neighborhood like the one I live in, in the inner city of Baltimore, and see that little fella and and actually almost recruit him for, say, the Naval Academy or what have you. So it's not just and so you've got so if you've got four hundred and thirty five of us plus reaching and pulling folk that might not even normally even consider the Coast Guard, that's very, very significant. And I don't think that that needs to be, you know, downplayed because it's, it's very serious. Now, I, the money that you have, the 18 million, I, I realize that's supposed to be spread a, amongst a, a lot of responsibilities. But again, I think just to kind of poo-poo uh, the proposal, which is similar to the one that we use for the Naval Academy, the Army, and all, of, all the other academies, um, I think we need to be very careful with that because, again, um, what we want is a diverse, a very diverse uh, core of leaders. We live in a diverse country, and so it makes sense for the morale, but it makes sense of the, of the institution, but it makes sense for something else. It makes sense to make sure that somebody has something that they can even dream about. Basically, what you've said here, to some degree, is they don't even know, they don't even have it to dream about because they don't know about it. I, I concur, so, Mr. Chairman. We I'm do sorry? want those, I concur, Mr. Chairman. We do yeah. want those individuals to have dreams. And, and I don't even know your story. I don't know your story. But I'm sure that at some point, somebody introduced the Coast Guard to you, or you would not be the great officer that you are today. Somebody had to give that to uh, a young 18-year-old uh, who may not have even been thinking about military. I don't know. Yes, sir. But you're here today. And I you am. But, and see, the problem that I have is that if we don't open up and, and show people things and show young people things, they will go a lifetime not, not giving, not developing into a rear admiral and therefore depriving themselves of certain development and depriving us as a country and the world of the gifts that they bring. Yes, Mr. Chairman, or not even considering the opportunity that might exist for them. That's right. And again, we, we welcome the partnership. We would like the candidates from members of Congress. We, again, I got our you. view is, the nomin is whether it has to be at the point of a nomination. Could we not take it up to that point and use a different process? Does it have to be the nomination for Congress to reach out and help us provide that visibility? And if I may, Mr. Chairman, be beyond just the academy, remember the academy, although it's more significant than the other services, is only 50% of our officer corps. The rest of it comes from within our workforce and the seven other programs that we have that go to collegiate institutions where the reason the 70% is so high or is that 70% for the academy is because we don't compete as well. We get some very fine uh, individuals who do have dreams and want to join the Coast Guard and they're successful with that, but we're not getting the diversity that we need from those institutions or from the pools that we're getting, not just the institutions, that's not their fault. Um, and when we look at uh, the, the scholarship programs that we offer to students at the two-year point through our um, C-SPY program where we will pay the remainder of their college for, for them and they will go directly to the officer candidate school. We would love to have some assistance finding some additional candidates for all of those programs, so not just the academy. Also our enlisted force, while we're doing well, 30 to 39 percent, should we be satisfied with that? Absolutely not. So we would welcome any increase across any part of our workforce, including our civilian workforce. Mr. Gilchrist. Mr. Mr. Chairman, could I ask Gentlemen. what I hope would be a timely follow-up? Mr. Taylor, yes. Admiral, I'm, I'm going to throw four names at you. Uh, Commandant Mundy, CNO Mike Borda, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs Colin Powell, 
uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Shelley Casfili, all got to the top of their careers through non, but through sources other than their respective academies. I'm curious in the Coast Guard, your last three commandants, were they all academy grads? Yes, sir, I believe they were. And the, the point is, Mr. Chairman, yeah, there's an opportunity to be an officer. But what about to get to the top? I would and point out that Vice Admiral Cray is not. Okay. Nor am I, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Gilchrist, I want to thank you for your patience. That's the Eastern Shore, Elijah. We're patient over there. We, we wait for the sun to come up before we milk those cows. Um, and, and Mr. Cummings publicly announced his assumption that he's going to heaven. So I just wanted all of us to, <laughs> wanted all, to all of us to recognize that. <laughs> That's confidence, Elijah. Um, I will say, <laughs> um, I keep in touch with the people I served with in Vietnam, and I was in the Marine Corps, and I remember the swimming classes were not very pleasant back then, but we learned how to swim. The people from all across the country, urban, rural, suburban, they put you in those cattle cars, ran you down to the pool, and they threw you in with all your gear on. Um, but uh, the fellow I was talking to, Sergeant Bathurst, he stayed in the Marine Corps for 36 years, retired as a colonel. This is, this is um, a travesty, I suppose, to say if there's any old jarheads in the room. But he and I both agreed that if we had it to start all over again, we would have gone into the Coast Guard. And what he's doing to his grandchildren is encouraging them if they have the proclivity or the, in, or the motivation to go into a military service, is to go into the Coast Guard, because we remember as former Marines 40 years ago, we used to train and train and train. And you know, we went to Vietnam, we went to the Dominican Republic, we did these other things, but you spend months sometimes just training the Coast Guard. When they train, they're out there on the high seas. And they're enforcing fishing laws, they're saving lives. And by the way, I know the chairman mentioned this about the, the, the Coast Guard uh, people that were lost um, in the Pacific. And I just wanted to add my condolences to them and to the Coast Guard Service for all of that. I think what we're trying to do here, one other quick comment, though, to the Master Chief. Um, you said that this was a one-time life, this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to testify, testify before Congress. Is the Coast Guard missing, am I missing something? You don't have enough opportunities in the Coast Should we, should you go down to the Antarctic and, and get on that icebreaker or, or you needed to come to the, I'm just, just kidding. I'm in a rare mood this afternoon. I'd like to answer that, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, if you can get me on an icebreaker in Antarctica, I'd take it right today. Okay. <laughs> at, at going further, I, I didn't say once in a lifetime. I said an opportunity of a lifetime. Oh, all right. Okay. I agree. But anyway, the point is, what, what we're trying to do here, what the committee is trying to do is to figure out, and you're trying to figure out, how we can enhance the diversity, uh, a reflection of this great country, which is in essence, to quote Walt Whitman, our country is the race of races. We represent the diversity of the world. And it's, it's that diversity that makes us who we are as a nation and can actually reflect, I think, and enhance um, the bounty of ingenuity, courage, intellect, and initiative of any branch of service. I experienced that when I was in the service. Um, so if you could just um, ponder and maybe answer it now or think about it and come back to us later. Uh, other than all of the various methods that you're trying to use to, to find those young people in inner cities that don't know how to swim and are afraid of water, but maybe make great Coast Guard officers, um, is there a way to um, sort of think out of the box for some hybrid nomination process for the Coast Guard that this Congress that is willing to move forward on this um, 
uh, would, would like to help you out with. Um, sir, we have actually proposed, uh, provided some drafting assistance with some language on a hybrid. Mm. Um, should that be the desire of Congress? Great. Thank you very much. If I may, sir, uh, your, your, the question you asked or the comment you made about uh, um, opportunities for individuals and particularly in the inner city, I, I would like to point out that we could also use assistance with our uh, civilian workforce. You know, as we look at opportunities that exist, much of the conversation here has really has focused on the military component. We have 7,500 and growing civilians in our population who don't have to go to sea. Now, some of them, we have certainly have contractors that go to sea and support. Sometimes they go out in a support mode and do, in fact, uh, deploy with our units. But we have many, many different kinds of opportunities, and we could certainly use uh, enhanced diversity in that population also, sir. Well, thank you very much for your service and your informative testimony, both of you. Thank, thank you, you very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Tell me, what uh, are your specific objectives? Um, you know, you talked a lot about the uh, C-SPY program, and we've gotten um, a number of uh, memos from the Coast Guard generally talking about what they wanted to do as far as reaching out. Do you have some goals? I mean, you know, I, there's not a lot that I agree with Ronald Reagan about, but he did say, um, I did say something in Verify. I want to make sure that if there is, I mean, any kind of, I think there should be some kind of accountability. I'm trying to figure out where we're going with all of this. You follow me? Uh, I'm not following In other following words, what I'm saying to you is that what are the specific objectives that, that uh, are to be achieved through the partnering of a flag officer or SES staff member with a minority serving, Hispanic serving, or a tribal council institution? The Navy challenges their senior officers not just to visit minority schools, but to recruit minority officers for their service. What is the Coast Guard doing to challenge each flag officer and commanding officer of your uh, major units, such as air stations, sectors, cutters, buoy tenders, et cetera? Um, private corporations, uh, uh, in many instances, part of their promotion scheme is they look to see how diverse they are their managers are, are, how their managers are doing with regard to diversity and, and promotions and what have you. And I'm just wondering, do you have objectives? I mean, does, is, is, are we just sort of flying by the seat of our pants or do we have some objectives here? Sir, as we look at this outreach initiative, it is building on some of the past experiences that we have had in working with um, minority serving institutions. Our initial goal is to go in at the senior level of the institution and begin working with them down through the deans to make sure that they are aware of opportunities within the Coast Guard and especially our scholarship programs. We think we have something to offer these institutions and we're looking for opportunities for the institutions to work with and help us as we look at the diversity and opportunities to help those young people you were describing, Mr. Chairman, to look at their dreams and see whether the Coast Guard is part of their dream and if we can help make that dream a reality. With that, we, it is not, quite frankly, our flags and SESs are all very nice people, very smart people, but we are not relevant to a student population. So in addition to the flag and SES, we are going to have mid-grade and junior officers linked up for relevancy to that workforce or to that student population that can answer their questions, that can avail them of the opportunities that exist, that can mentor them or invite them to visit our units and so forth. We're going to focus initially on two-year institutions. We have a list of schools that we're looking to work at for our C -SPI, our, uh, the reorientation of our C-SPY program, Mr. Chairman, as well as we are very much focused on two-year institutions as a feeder to our Coast Guard Academy, which we believe no other academy has a program like that, that they will go in and, and set up a relationship with a two-year school that at the one-year point we would select students. We tried it with four-year institutions, and quite understandably, they're interested in those students continuing and graduating from their schools. At a two-year institution, those institutions are looking for their, their student populations to go on to a four-year college and complete their degrees, hopefully, or they will go out into the workforce. We would like to afford the opportunity for some portion of that population to understand the opportunities that exist at the Coast Guard Academy, and after one year, go to the Coast Guard Academy and complete their degree there, Mr. Chairman. 
Let me uh, let me conclude this hearing by saying this: that um, one of the things that I um, I think is as you get older and you begin to face your own mortality, and you begin to look at um, people who have been on the battlefield of civil rights and for a long time, and then then they die. They die. They fight, they fight and fight, and then they die. And then a new group of soldiers come along to fight the fight. What I'm getting at is the reason why I asked about goals is because we can be sitting here 30 years from now making these same arguments. I won't be here, I'll be gone. And some kind of way, I think it helps to have something I mean, we can talk. We can talk from now until forever, but the question is: is you know, what are we doing? Or what do we have in place to measure what we're doing so that we know that there's progress being made? And what are the specific programs? And I understand that there's some things that people will benefit from. Perhaps some things the Coast Guard may do, and it may not end up. They may not end up in the Coast Guard. I, I understand that. But at the same time, our goal is to get more people, get a more, more diverse force. So I, I don't know how you do that without having some type of measuring tool. I just don't. Yes, Mr. And Chairman. so far, I'm going to be very frank with you, I have not, maybe I missed it, maybe I wasn't listening carefully, but I haven't heard anything about a measuring tool out of all, everything you've said, every syllable. I think you've been very forceful. I think you've carried, uh, You've carried the weight for the Coast Guard very nicely. Um, and I've tried to be polite. I'm not usually this polite in other hearings. Um, I appreciate this, Mr. Chairman. But I'm be honest with you, I'm getting a little frustrated because I don't feel, um, I, I guess I don't want to waste my time and I don't want to waste yours, nor do I want to waste the committee's time. Um, but I just feel like we've gotten a lot, you've said a lot, but I don't know where we're going with it and how we measure it. Let, All right. Sir, Mr. Chairman, if I may, let me, let me provide you some tangible. Sure. We, we have 61 tabs for our college student pre-commissioning initiative. Uh, that is not as diverse a pool as we want. I was very involved in that when I was at the recruiting command, and in fact, I was responsible for expanding it to its current definition. It is now yielding an outcome while we get some very good people. It is not getting us into those very neighborhoods and that very exposure, sir, that you talked to us about. So if I look at C-SPY program, I want that more than 50 percent. In fact, my goal is to get it up to 60 to 75 percent. If I look at the tabs that we are currently using for the preparatory program for the, for the Coast Guard Academy, I believe that we should be at least at 70 to 75 percent of those being uh, other than white males, sir. So are, is that specific enough for you, Mr. Chairman? That's better. That's much better. And if you have anything else, we've got to, we're going to have to end this hearing. Did you have something else? I'm sorry, Ms. Richardson. Did you have something else? Um, I'm going to have to end the hearing, but um, you know, I may follow up with some, a few questions. Uh, but thank you all very much. And thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the committee. Sends the hearing. Thank you. Objectives and timelines and goals, some kind of goals. 